Master of Economics at Harvard University, a senior fellow of the Hoover Institution of Stanford University, and a research as associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. He earned his PhD in economics from Harvard University and his BS in physics from Caltech. Dr. Barrow is co-editor of Harvard's Quarterly Journal of Economics and was recently president of the Western Economic Association and vice president of the American Economic Association. He has written as a viewpoint columnist for Business Week as a contributing editor of the Wall Street Journal. He is the author or co-author of a number of books, including Macroeconomics, A Modern Approach, Economic Growth, Nothing is Sacred, Economic Ideas for a New Millennium, Getting It Right, Markets and Choices in a Free Society, and Education and Modernization Worldwide from the 19th to the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming to Hillsdale College, Dr. Robert Barrow. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, again and to be talking on one of my favorite topics, which is Milton Friedman. Um, so my contact with Milton began in the early 1970s. I had been, um, my first job was as an assistant professor at Brown University, and then I managed to get tenure there. But then I visited in Chicago, and Milton persuaded me to give up the tenure I had at Brown to move to the University of uh, Chicago. Um, sometimes Milton's advice to me was not as great uh, as at other times. <laughs> and I'm not sure that this was the wisest decision I ever made, but I guess it worked out okay in the end. Uh, just to prove that I actually uh, knew Milton, here's a photo that was taken by George Stigler Stigler was an avid photographer who basically always went around with his camera. So we had a regular doubles tennis group. Uh, we played in Flossmoor, Illinois, which is where George lived. And this time it was Milton in the center, and I'm on the left. Uh, Stigler was the third uh, member who took the picture. And Gary Becker normally was the fourth uh, participant in this uh, doubles match, but he was out that day. He was substituted by Arnold Zellner, the famous econometrician who's on the, on the right here. Now, one of the benefits from my going to Chicago in the early 1970s was that Milton was still running the famous money and banking uh, workshop. And he had a very unusual approach to carrying out uh, the workshop, which got to be known as the page one, page two method. So Milton would start out the workshop without letting the speaker say anything, and he would just announce to the group, uh, who has comments on page one? And then somebody presumably would say something, and then the speaker would be allowed to respond, and other people would chime in, and, uh, and so on. Uh, now Milton claimed that the reason he was following this format was that it was a lot more efficient than the usual method of having the author present the paper. And moreover, he said it was good because it forced the participants to actually read the paper in advance. Otherwise, they would not have comments on page one, uh, et cetera. But I think the real motivation for this approach was that it gave Milton a much greater share of the discussion time than otherwise would have occurred. And frankly, I think that was a benefit to everybody present, because uh, normally Milton was much more interesting than the author of the, uh, of the paper. So while I was preparing the talk for today, I went through my files, and I was quite surprised to find a letter from Milton from 1987, which I had completely uh, forgotten about. Um, here's the letter on Hoover Institution stationery. Milton retired from the University of Chicago in 1977 and moved to Hoover. Uh, this is written August 5th, 1987. Uh, he says, do I take the announcement of your change of address 
to mean that you have accepted a permanent position at Harvard, or is this a temporary move? In either case, let me congratulate you. So when I read this note over, having forgotten about it from 28 years ago, I thought he was congratulating me and he was just being pleasant. Uh, so I passed the note by my wife and a couple of other people, and they actually had very different opinions of what this letter really meant. And my wife in particular thought that Milton was saying that what a big mistake I was making by going to Harvard, and that I really should have stayed in Chicago all along. But I'm really not sure whether that's what uh, Milton intended. Uh, anyway, given the derogatory remarks that Steve Forbes had yesterday about Harvard, um, <laughs> I'm going to send them this note, a copy of this note, and see what he thinks about it. Now, I'm supposed to talk about Milton Friedman and monetarism, uh, Milton Friedman and his macroeconomic uh, guys. Uh, and, of course, Milton was very famous for his thinking, uh, particularly in the monetary area. Uh, but, frankly, I think Milton's most important contributions to economic knowledge were on the microeconomic side, or really in terms of applied uh, price theory. And his overarching theme in that context was about the benefits of free markets and private enterprise, and I think he was very persuasive in showing how that worked out in a number of policy areas. Um, now, the best book, I think, that exists in terms of communicating uh, important economics to a general and wide audience uh, is Capitalism and Freedom, which came out of uh, lectures that Milton had given in the early 1950s, and the book appeared, I believe it was in 1956. Um, uh, excuse me, it, it actually appeared uh, later in 1962. Um, so I think anybody who's not a professional economist who wants to gain knowledge of a variety of aspects of economics. This is still the best book to read. And frankly, I'm amazed every time I go through this book, I learn something new, and I'm really uh, impressed by what Milton's thinking was uh, this, this long ago. So there are a lot of uh, important policy ideas that are expressed in capitalism uh, and freedom. And many of these ideas seemed to be completely radical at the time they were initially expressed, such as uh, from the early 1950s up to 1962. So as a selection of items that are in that book, we have the uh, idea of an all-volunteer army as opposed to uh, conscription. We have the idea of privatized social security, which applies in many countries, and Chile is a particularly good example of a system that seems to work effectively. He also proposed a negative income tax as a kind of generalized form of welfare that would uh, replace an array of existing welfare programs, and the earned income tax credit uh, has the kind of structure that Milton uh, essentially laid out in Capitalism and Freedom. He had the idea of a flat rate income tax. Uh, which applies currently in a number of countries or uh, localities. And amazingly enough, that's true of both, both Russia and Massachusetts, two places that have a communist heritage, I suppose. <laughs> uh, he also had the idea of school vouchers uh, related to uh, Charter schools, for example, which have become quite important in many uh, localities in the United States. And he also had uh, a design of a welfare uh, system that would be more market-oriented. And one of the amazing events in the 1990s was that uh, Bill Clinton actually implemented a lot of these ideas. Uh, I might say that aside from rhetoric, uh, the two presidents that have been the best in terms of policies in the U.S. Uh, since World War II, I would say, were Ronald Reagan and then Bill Clinton. And even though you listen to Bill Clinton today and he can sound very uh, uh, anti-market and unpleasant, in terms of the actual policies during his administration, I think they were mostly pretty good on an economic uh, uh, perspective. Also in capitalism and freedom, we had the idea of open capital markets, which have become pretty much the norm in the developed world. 
Uh, we had the idea of flexible exchange rates, uh, which has also become quite prevalent. Uh, he didn't talk about decriminalization of drugs in capitalism and freedom, but I think pressured partly by his good friend Gary Becker, uh, eventually Milton came out in favor of uh, decriminalization of drugs. He, I think that was in uh, particularly some Newsweek columns that Milton had. And I think this idea is currently moving toward uh, acceptance, even though uh, a particular proposal was uh, very recently rejected in Ohio. Finally, in terms of a uh, topic more pertinent to what I'm supposed to talk about today, Milton had strong arguments in favor of monetary stability, aimed especially toward price stability, toward low and stable uh, inflation. And I think Milton has been very successful in that general concept, although his specific famous proposal, which was a constant growth rate rule for some monetary aggregate, has not proven to be successful. And in fact, eventually, Milton uh, basically retracted that idea. And that's the only idea I know of that Milton once held firmly, which he uh, went back on. Uh, normally, Milton didn't make mistakes, and I think in this context, he decided this wasn't really uh, the optimal way to conduct monetary policy. From an academic standpoint, in terms of the uh, conceptual framework, Milton's ideas on money are laid out best in the essay, uh, The Quantity of Money, a Restatement. Uh, excuse me, it should say Quantity Theory of Money, a Restatement and then also in the subsequent uh, Monetary History of the United States, which uh, Milton wrote jointly with uh, Anna Jacobson uh, Schwartz. So those are the two works that really lay out the basic thinking that Milton had about money and its role in the economy. Um, so Milton's vision of the quantity theory of money is what later became uh, described as monetarism. So I don't really think there's a distinct distinction between those terminologies. But there were two key features that Milton stressed in terms of what does it mean to be a quantity theorist with respect to uh, money. Um, one is that the, uh, in many circumstances, for example, at looking at history, the nominal quantity of money was determined in ways independent of shifts in the real demand for money. So in many circumstances, you could think of shifts in money that had occurred in what economists would say was an exogenous manner, and then you could look at what was the impact on the economy from those changes. Uh, the second thing that Milton uh, argued was a key feature of this quantity theory uh, was that the real demand for money, how much money people wanted to hold in terms of purchasing power, was a stable function of a few key variables which would uh, particularly involve real income and something like the nominal interest rate, which is a cost of holding uh, money. So the idea is if you have these two key f features and then the monetary authority controls the quantity of money, then indirectly, because of the stable uh, demand for money, you have uh, influence over the basic macroeconomic variables, in particular the price level, but maybe also something about real economic activity. So in the monetary history, Milton, uh, along with Anna Schwartz, explored how money supply was determined in the U.S. under different historical regime, regimes, one of which was the gold standard. And they argued that historically, much of the movements in money was independent of changes in the demand. And then you could look at how did the economy respond in these various uh, periods. And furthermore, they argued that the association they found between changes in nominal money and changes in real economic activity, that these associations were typically positive, and in the main you could interpret that as causal influence from monetary shocks to real economic activity. So when money expanded, it tended to be that the real gross domestic product went up and vice versa. And that was interpreted as monetary influences on uh, real activity. I might say that the gold standard is certainly uh, examined in some detail in the monetary history, um, but my reading is that Milton was not really a fan of the gold standard. There are a lot of positive features of the gold standard. I can understand why a lot of people uh, appreciate that system and kind of have a wishful uh, 
uh, memory in terms of going back to that system. But as Milton well recognized, there were also some major shortcomings of the gold standard in terms of what kind of uh, economic mechanism uh, uh, it, it, it put in place in the economy. Um, one problem with the uh, gold standard is that if you fix the price of gold, which is what was done historically for periods of great length both in the U.S. and the U.K. and elsewhere, uh, it doesn't really ensure price stability, uh, particularly over a short horizon. Um, the relative price of gold and other things is just too variable. So pegging the price of gold doesn't really give you very good control over the general price level, which is normally what uh, you're interested in, in terms of uh, creating price stability. It was also quite clear historically that, uh, for example, in the United States, there was a, a long-term uh, regular history of bank runs and banking panics, which occurred under the gold standard. So the gold standard did not prevent those kinds of uh, disruptions in terms of the financial and banking uh, system. So the question is whether we should think of Milton as in some sense being a Keynesian. Now, the funny aspect of this is that when Milton was writing initially on monetary history and similar events, when he was writing in the 1960s, his views from, uh, were viewed as anti-Keynesian from a perspective of typical macroeconomists. And I think the reason for that is that if you look at Keynes's general theory, then Keynes de-emphasized monetary disturbances as a key element in business fluctuations. And he also didn't think that active monetary policy was a, an efficient instrument for stabilizing the business cycle. Um, so therefore, when, when Milton was particularly bringing out the important real role of, uh, of money in terms of economic fluctuations, as he did in the monetary history, that was counter to what Keynes was uh, arguing in the general theory. And for that reason, Milton was viewed as not being a Keynesian with respect to his 1960s uh, thinking. But later on, typical Keynesians, sometimes called New Keynesians, uh, got the idea that by moving around monetary policy in an active way, you could make use of the fact that money was so powerful in influencing economic activity and therefore use active monetary policy to achieve economic stabilization. So that perspective became, since the 1980s, a hallmark of Keynesianism. And that viewpoint fit very well with what Milton was arguing about money and the economy in the 1960s. So in that respect, Milton's thinking became what you might call as too much of the Keynesian approach. Now, Milton also had a very important uh, article in the 1967 American Economic Review, which was his presidential address called The Role of Monetary Policy. Um, this article, along with work by uh, Edmund Phelps, foreshadowed what Bob Lucas led in the 1970s as the rational expectations revolution in macroeconomics. So the major element there was that in the long run, money would be neutral. And if you had big changes in money in the long run, it would just affect price level and it wouldn't affect real economic activity. But in the short run, unanticipated monetary movements and unanticipated movements in prices could have major real economic effects. That was the idea of Lucas, and that was uh, the material that was in Milton's 1967 presidential address. Now, if you take that viewpoint, you still get the idea that monetary policy can be quite important in terms of stabilizing the real economy. Uh, in the long run, money would be neutral, but in the short run, money would have major real consequences. And then it's not too much of a leap from there to argue that a wise monetary authority, maybe even the Federal Reserve, could do good things in terms of stabilizing the economy. So Milton's view of money then became a defense for activism, particularly in terms of how the Federal Reserve would intervene. And it's no wonder that this part of uh, Milton's monetary macro framework was then embraced by Keynesians in the 1980s and, and thereafter. <clears throat> 
So the question is, how do you go from Milton's monetary framework, which seems to suggest that monetary policy could do a lot to stabilize the economy, to Milton's practical advice for monetary policy, which was not to be activist, and to do something more like uh, increase some monetary aggregate at 3% per year and then don't attempt to do anything else. There seems to be an inconsistency between these two aspects of what Milton had laid out. Now, to reconcile the two, you need a further argument, uh, like the long and variable lags between monetary impulses and real responses, which Milton laid out in another book, uh, A Program for Monetary Stability. Another idea along these lines, which, imp which reinforces this long and variable legs, is the distinction between rules and authorities, or more often called rules versus discretion. This line of thinking produces a benefit from the monetary authority being committed to something like price stability, and the fact that people can count on that rather than worrying about being surprised by monetary stimulation in the positive direction or by monetary contraction in the negative way. This is, in fact, the chief feature of the gold standard that's attractive. If the monetary authority is constrained to maintain the price of gold, that, that's a kind of commitment which avoids activism and it avoids a lot of policy discretion. It has some other shortcomings that I tried to lay out uh, before. But there is a good argument along these lines about why it's better if the monetary authority uh, doesn't give in to the temptation to either try to inflate the economy or to contract it. Now, these extensions of uh, Milton's monetary macro framework can reconcile his uh, theory about money with his practical policy advice, which was that the monetary authority should try to have price stability and not seek to guide the uh, economy in terms of uh, moderating business fluctuations. Now, Milton's specific proposal was to pick a monetary aggregate. Um, he thought about M1, which is currency and checkable deposits. He looked at a broader aggregate, which included a larger class of uh, short-term liquid financial instruments called M2. And then his proposal was that you should pick one of these, and he ended up preferring M2 and saying, well, the monetary authority should just expand this aggregate at something like 2 to 3 percent per year and then basically go home. So it shouldn't do anything more activist than that, is what he uh, uh, recommended. The, the problem with that approach is that the real demand for money is not that stable. As I mentioned, that's one of the two key underpinnings that Milton laid out in terms of thinking about the quantity theory of money, the stability of the real demand for money. But empirically, it's not true that the demand for money is that stable. And that means that by uh, having a constant growth path for a nominal aggregate, you don't really achieve price stability. You don't really achieve a low and stable inflation rate. Now, that's particularly apparent in the recent period. In the recent period, uh, since 2009, we've had this dramatic run-up in real M2 or real uh, uh, monetary base. And a way to think about that is that something has dramatically shifted the amount that people want to hold in terms of uh, monetary instruments, in terms of currency, in terms of deposits. That's run up dramatically, but we haven't had much inflation. Now, frankly, this is a big surprise to me. If you had told me in 2009 that the Fed was going to raise the monetary base by $3 trillion within a few years, I would have said that that would be tremendously inflationary. And I don't think it's that easy to explain what's happened, although I can offer some ideas about that. So what's happened in terms of the data Monetary base has gone up like crazy, along with the expansion of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. Broader monetary aggregates have also been growing very rapidly. For example, Milton's favorite M2 has grown at over 6% per year since 2009. 
but we've not had much inflation. The average inflation rate has been very low, less than 2% per year. The only way you can understand that is to allow for the fact that there's been a dramatic increase over this period in the real quantity of money demanded, the real amount that people are willing to hold, particularly uh, financial institutions. Now, my understanding of why that's happened is that people are very nervous about this economy. There's been a tremendous increase in uncertainty, and a reaction to that is to be uh, more and more willing to hold short-term liquid assets, even though they don't pay much of a rate of return. And that's why the nominal interest rate can be close to zero and real interest rates can be negative. It's because this worry about the future has dramatically increased the real demand for money. That's my understanding of it. It's a, uh, an example of the real demand for money being uh, unstable, but my particular explanation certainly might not be fully uh, uh, correct. Now, one way or another, a successful monetary policy has to allow the quantity of money, the nominal quantity, to adjust to shifts in the real demand. And that's what Milton's constant growth rate rule does not uh, do. Now, a system that does allow for these kinds of adjustments is inflation targeting, which has become quite prevalent among world central banks, uh, particularly since the late uh, 1980s. Uh, now, this is a system where nominal interest rates are moved by the central bank whenever, in particular, inflation is doing something different from what is desired. So if inflation goes above a target, like, say, 2% per year, the response of the central bank is to raise nominal interest rates and vice versa when the inflation rate is too low. And this system was uh, initially pursued in an explicit form by New Zealand in 1989, and it was adopted by most of the uh, principal central banks and really has been in place until the financial crisis of 2008-2009 when things became more complicated. Now a key feature of this system is that it allows the nominal quantity of money to adjust automatically when the real quantity demanded moves around. And that's what's missing in the constant growth rate rule that Milton had uh, uh, proposed. Well, let me skip that. Now, more recently, there have been difficulties in maintaining the regime of inflation targeting. For example, in the United States, but also in other countries, when the nominal interest rate got down to zero, it really was not feasible to go further to cut when deflation was threatening. So you couldn't, under the typical system, have nominal interest rates that were negative. So that's been the environment for some years now in the United States and in some other countries. And because of that, some central banks, including in Japan, but also in the US, have moved back to a system where they look directly at quantities of monetary aggregates. And that's often called quantitative easing. So the Federal Reserve, following the uh, financial crisis in 2009, um, particularly tried to expand the nominal quantity of money. And in conjunction with that, the Federal Reserve increased dramatically the assets held on its balance sheet. Now, initially, because the crisis was focused on mortgage-backed securities, the Fed emphasized printing money and buying up uh, mortgage-backed securities, which I thought was a very unfortunate choice of policy because it was getting the government into an area that it should not be involved in, which is uh, essentially subsidizing the credit for a particular part of the economy, which was uh, mortgages related to residential housing. Um, subsequently, the Fed shifted more toward traditional open market operations in quantitative easing, where it buy, bought up a lot of government bonds, particularly longer-term government bonds. Um, but I would guess any month now, the Federal Reserve will finally move away from targeting a nominal interest rate around zero and will raise rates into positive territory, and I think they should have done that actually many months ago. Well, going back to Milton's policy ideas, uh, I think anybody who wants to know what Milton had been thinking 
should, as I mentioned, start with capitalism and freedom and then go on to the work Free to Choose uh, from the early 1980s, uh, out of which a TV show was made that made Moulton into a, a household name. Uh, so, for example, I was once going with Milton somewhere, and we were in O'Hare Airport in Chicago, and someone spotted Milton uh, from across the way and became almost hysterical, as though seeing a rock star, and came up to us and was trying to get Milton to sign something or other, and Milton told me this sort of thing happened to him all the time, which I found kind of surprising. If you look at Milton's memoirs, which he wrote jointly with his wife Rose, he also mentioned that the only European country that failed to air uh, Free to Choose on television was France, which I guess suggests that some things never change. But, uh... So I also learned from Milton's memoirs that he didn't do much in terms of direct policy uh, involvement with the government. Uh, in the 1930s, in the mid-1930s, he was in New Deal, uh, Washington, uh, apparently because he couldn't get any other job, uh, which is kind of surprising now that nobody wanted to hire Milton Friedman. Um, and then he was again in the government during World War II. My conclusion from what Milton says he did while working for the government was that he actually would not have been a very good policy advisor or an actual uh, uh, administrator or supervisor in the government. In fact, the main thing he did during World War II while working for the U.S. government was to help design the system of federal income tax withholding. Uh, now, Milton says, and I think he's probably right, that no single act has done more to expand the size of the federal government than uh, income tax withholding. You really can't have a dramatically large government sector financed particularly by an income tax without tax withholding. And Milton uh, certainly regrets that he participated in that part of the policy process. But nevertheless, I guess I would have loved to have seen Milton as chair of the Federal Reserve. Uh, of course, they publish the meetings now. I imagine the meetings would have been pretty boring with Milton as the chair. He would have said something like, well, we decided to expand M2 at an annual rate of 3%, and then presumably would have adjourned the meeting. So I guess they wouldn't have taken very long. Milton also told a story uh, in the memoirs about what happened when he was uh, the president of the American Economic Association, which was in 1967. Uh, so Milton was concerned that the society had accumulated a substantial surplus. I think at the time it was around $8 billion, something about that uh, magnitude. Uh, but he was worried that the association was sitting with this money with no particular designated use and that some social do-gooder would come up with some ill-advised uh, purpose for which the money could go. So Milton thought that he could contribute to general welfare and specifically to the society by coming up with a way to get rid of this accumulated surplus. So what he did at the time was he started up a new journal, Journal of Economic Literature, without raising the dues, and that created a deficit which then reduced the balance that was at the AEA um, to something like $4 million. So when I was a vice president of the American Economic Association in 1998, I was worried about something similar because, again, the association had managed to accumulate a large surplus. So I remember I proposed at the meeting that we should have a major cut in the dues as a way to eliminate uh, the accumulated wealth of the society. Um, the society already had three journals at that point, so it didn't seem like one could introduce another one in order to use up the money. Um, but I failed miserably at this proposal. Unlike Milton, who was very persuasive and was able to introduce the new journal without ra raising the dues, uh, I don't think I got any votes of support in favor of my proposal. But a few years later, the association actually did what I had recommended. And there was a major cut in the dues. But nevertheless, because the association has such a large scale with people paying in uh, membership dues, that it now has $32 million in terms of its endowment. This is in 2014. Uh, so I think one would be worried again about what are they going to do with this money. 
So Milton also had this famous quote, which he discusses in his memoirs. Um, this was in uh, Time magazine in December 1965, where he was quoted to the effect of uh, saying, we are all Keynesians now. And Milton wrote a letter to Time in 1966 explaining, here's what I meant by this uh, statement. In the first respect, I meant that Keynes had essentially invented macroeconomics as a separate field. And I think that's true. And in that sense, Milton meant that any macroeconomist was a Keynesian because you were using the kind of macro apparatus that uh, Keynes had uh, invented. In the second sense, Milton would argue implications that Milton uh, indicated in his uh, letter from 1966. So I think this is the most famous photo of Milton Friedman. So Milton's the short guy in the middle, and George Stigler is the uh, tall guy on the right. No one seems to know who took this photo, but it's clearly outside the faculty club at the University of Chicago, and probably walking back to the economics department after lunch. So one thing you might notice if you look carefully at this photo is that Milton is squarely in the middle of the road, whereas George was hugging the right edge of the road. And that reminded me of Milton's famous joke. I think this was from uh, Milton to begin with. And he said with respect to policy, he said the problem with being in the middle of the road is you get hit by traffic in both directions. But apparently here he was in the middle of the road, but maybe it had nothing to do with policy. So this is actually my favorite photo of Milton. Um, it was taken by George Stigler, who of course was always taking photographs, and I got this from George's son, Stephen Stigler. So Milton here was getting a traffic ticket on the Calumet Expressway, uh, I think in 1972, that's uh, outside of Chicago, and he was probably on the way to a tennis match. So I think here there's some lessons about law and order, because uh, you can see that Milton must have broken the law, given that he was pulled over, but he also seems to have a lot of respect for legal authority, since he's complying with the instructions of the police officer. So it gives you two important aspects about the legal system. One is that law and order is very important for society, but secondly, from an individual standpoint, sometimes it's rational to break the law, and that's apparently what happened in this, uh, this case. So I wanted to conclude about the last time I actually saw Milton. So this was in the summer of 2006 at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, and I just chanced on uh, Milton and Rose walking on the steps outside of Hoover, and we got into some conversation, and it must have been on Milton's mind because he told me out of the blue, he said, you know, I never planned to be uh, living to age 94, and I don't think I've planned for it properly, and I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing now that I'm still alive. Something like that. So later that summer, I saw Milton for the last time as in San Francisco. Uh, George Schultz, who's a fellow of the Hoover Institution and, of course, was Secretary of State and almost everything else in the government, uh, was hosting a party. The party was in honor of Tony Blair, who was no longer in office in the UK, and uh, I think Tony Blair was looking for a job at the time, was my uh, uh, impression. Uh, so there were many prominent people uh, present at this party that George Schultz was hosting in San Francisco, and I recall asking someone, I don't know why I came up with this, I said, do you know who is the most important person in this room? And the uh, person I was talking to didn't know how to respond to that and kind of was thinking about all the people uh, who were present. Uh, so I helped him out by giving him the clear answer, which was Milton Friedman. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Biro. We now have time for a few questions. Um, if you would raise your hand and one of us will bring the mic to you. Thank you. 
uh, for that very uh, informative talk. Is there any empirical evidence that all this monetary easing uh, over the last uh, number of years has really improved the real economy? It's a very controversial topic. Um, I don't think there's evidence that it's done something positive for the real economy. And I think one has to start with the observation that, um, particularly since 2009, the recovery from the big recession has been very anemic. And in fact, uh, usually what's true after you reach the trough of a recession, that a recovery features economic growth at a rate that's above average. Uh, the long-term average growth rate in the U.S. for the real gross domestic product is about 3 percent or about 2 percent per capita, if you look at it that way. And the average growth rate of real GDP since that period has been about 2 percent, which means that we've lost relative to the normal growth rate uh, in what was supposed to be a recovery. I think the two main policies that were followed by the U.S. government since the uh, Great Recession, which ended in 2009, uh, were the monetary expansion that you uh, alluded to, uh, and also a dramatic increase in transfer payments of various types. Um, and I think if you look at the overall response, I think you have to say that the uh, uh, cumulative effect of those two interventions has certainly been disappointing and it doesn't look like they have positive effects on things. Um, now, of course, there's much broader evidence available on what is the effect of monetary changes on economic activity and there's some evidence about transfer payments, but uh, I don't think there's evidence that expanding transfer payments is a good way to accomplish economic growth. And I don't think it's right, uh, certainly not right over uh, six years, that monetary expansion is a way to get higher real economic growth. So I think I'm agreeing with the spirit of your question, which is that uh, I don't think it's been successful. Dr. Barrow, thank you so much for your time this evening. My question is going to go back to your slide under um, inflation rates and where you basically talked about central banks and how they can adjust in, uh, inflation rates and therefore improve economic situations and well-being uh, thereby. My question is, what is the criteria used by these banks in order to determine the appropriate rate of adjustment um, given the spirit of Friedrich Hayek's knowledge problem as well? If you would just mind talking about that, sir, thank you very much. I think many banks have used versions of what now it's called a Taylor rule, where you look at uh, in particular the inflation rate and you have in mind a kind of target inflation rate typically around two percent per year and then there's a kind of quantitative adjustment about how much you move nominal interest rates uh, particularly at the short term end in response to the inflation rate but it's somewhat of a trial by error type procedure I don't think that it's really something that comes out of some fitted model that has a lot of uh, explanatory power uh, it's also true empirically that central banks don't react just to inflation. In terms of moving around interest rates, they also uh, react to some measures of real economic activity. And in particular, the Federal Reserve has tended to focus on the labor market. So it tends to adjust uh, interest rates in response to unemployment and in, expense to, in response to weak employment growth. Those are the things that they've moved uh, in response to. I don't know that it's particularly useful for the central bank to be having that kind of response to the real economy. Uh, it doesn't seem like it was all that harmful in terms of, uh, say, 20 years of experience where we seem to have achieved pretty good uh, price stability. Because if you compare the period from the uh, late 1980s up to, say, 2009 with what was in place earlier, it looked like there was great success in terms of having achieved good inflation stability at a low rate uh, without compromising in terms of economic growth. I think that, so that looked like a major achievement not only of the Federal Reserve but of uh, central banks worldwide. Uh, so I thought that that was a positive thing, but things have become much more complicated since the Great Recession of 2008-2009. Dr. Barrow, thank you very much. Um, my question has to do with the current participation rate in the economy, and what do you think M Milton Friedman's response would be to the fact that it's the lowest since World War II? 
I think some of that has to do with expanded transfer payment programs, which have diminished the incentive of people to be in the workforce and, in general, to supply uh, labor. Um, I'm not sure what Milton in particular would say on this. He'd certainly uh, worry about the disincentive effects related to high transfer payments that were available in the same way that he would be worried about high tax rates. So in effect, if you lose a lot of transfer benefits by deciding to work and be in the labor force, that's just like having a high marginal tax rate on the income that you earn. So you'd want to kind of combine for an effective tax rate what you have to pay along with the benefits that you lose by, uh, uh, by working more and by being in the labor force. Um, so I think Milton would have said that this is a consequence of the kind of uh, fiscal policy that was uh, followed with respect to transfers, but maybe I'm putting words in Milton's mouth with regard to what he would have said, but that, that would be my vision of that. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. And I am wondering, do you anticipate the kind of um, financial or economic collapse that is heralded on so many television commercials, uh, including from uh, Dr. Stockman and other luminaries? I think there are various policy problems that have not been seriously addressed. For example, if you look at the uh, long-term fiscal imbalance that the U.S. has, which particularly relates to entitlement programs, and if you look at the inefficiencies in the tax system, I think there are serious reforms that need to be made there. I think President Obama could have done this in 2010. Uh, he had a very good commission that uh, reported on what would be a good set of policies, and he chose to basically ignore it and didn't put things in place. Uh, I think it's particularly true on the health care side that if you look into the future that uh, the burdens are astronomical and nothing's really been done to address that. In fact, the changes that have been made have expanded the burden because they've uh, increased the outlays without uh, uh, at the same time including some reforms that would uh, be effective on the cost side. Um, so I'm pretty nervous about the uh, situation in the U.S. Uh, and, and globally. I think I mentioned that before when I was trying to interpret why hasn't there been more inflation in the U.S. along with the vast monetary expansion. My way to interpret that is in terms of the uh, increase in uncertainty and concerns about future crises, things that might look like the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, or, or some other kind of fiscal-related crisis. So I think there's serious uh, reasons to be uh, concerned. Now, a lot of people think that the long-run rate of economic growth has also declined. Um, now, it is true if you look at the U.S. and uh, a set of other rich countries, and you look at the average rate of economic growth since, say, the year 2000, it's extremely low. Uh, the growth rate of um, real GDP per person since that period is 0.8 percent per year, averaged over the U.S. and some other countries, where the typical average is 2 percent per year. So if, in terms of information over now 14 years, it looks like there's been a slowdown in the average rate of economic growth, which you pro if you project that out into the future, it's a problem. But I guess my bigger concern, bigger even than uh, reduced average growth, is the potential for another kind of crisis, which uh, I think is certainly there. Uh, Dr. Barrow, I just want to thank you for coming and speaking today. History has given us a number of examples of central banks who lose control, lose their independence, and tend, this tends to be really inflationary once governments get control of the currency. There's been a lot of talk of auditing the Fed lately. Do you support this, and if so, to what extent do you think Congress should be able to audit and regulate the Fed? So I thought that the policy of the Fed since, say, 2009 has been really quite wild. Basically, the Fed has assembled a balance sheet that resembles Lehman Brothers in 2008, except that it's a much bigger scale. So they're basically borrowing a lot of money short term and then holding a lot of assets, which initially were these, a lot of mortgage-backed securities and then subsequently a lot of longer-term government bonds. Uh, 
If it was a private corporation doing that, you would say that looks very risky, very worrisome. What's going to happen if we ever move back to an environment where interest rates go up to a normal level and if there's some inflation? And it looks like the Fed was very vulnerable to that type of problem, and it still is. So I'm surprised that this problem hasn't shown up yet in terms of higher interest rates and in terms of inflation. And I've tried to explain maybe why that's true, but uh, it's a very worrisome problem. So I thought this was a mistaken form of policy, but it hasn't played out yet the way I would have predicted. So I have to acknowledge that that's uh, uh, the case. I think particularly when the Fed got into the business of buying up mortgage-related uh, securities, which essentially going into the real estate business, that that was uh, very dangerous in terms of uh, compromising the independence of the monetary authority. Because if the Fed is going to become a fiscal instrument, which is really what it was doing by buying up particular kinds of uh, assets like that, private sector assets, that that risks a lot of uh, interference or uh, control by the Congress. Because if the Fed is doing all kinds of things beyond its mandate, it becomes more plausible that the Congress should have uh, authority over them and they shouldn't really be an independent uh, entity. But if you ask me, what do I think will happen if the Congress gets more involved and they audit the Fed and they start controlling monetary policy? That presumed would be much worse than the, the Fed acting on its own. So in that respect, I'm not really a supporter of the idea that Congress should be more actively involved. I was more trying to advocate, as I have to people at the Fed uh, over the last several years, that they shouldn't be doing the kind of activities that compromise their independence. Um, but I have to say again, the fact that inflation has been very low and stable in this whole period is something they can come back with and say, look, in, in that respect, these results have been pretty good, even though economic growth has not been very strong. But I'm not really uh, in favor of auditing the Fed, and I don't know where that's going to go down the road in terms of uh, congressional monetary policy. Um, Dr. Barrow, um, earlier today you spoke in my class and you mentioned how you presented your Ricardian equivalence paper. And when you presented it, Milton Friedman was in the room, along with George Stigler and Gary Becker, I believe. And also just throughout your time at Harvard and Chicago, you've been around a lot of other great economists. And I was kind of wondering what it's like to work in that kind of environment every single day. And also, um, I'm an aspiring economist, my, economist myself, and so I was wondering if you have any advice for someone like me. <laughs> so when I went to Chicago in the early 1970s, it's true that the three great pillars of the Chicago school were there, Milton along with George Stigler and Gary Becker. Uh, I only saw them together in a seminar once, which was that time uh, I presented what subsequently became called uh, Ricardian Equivalence in, a, in the Money and Banking Workshop. Um, I should say that nobody said at the time that this is Ricardian Equivalence. It's not like that was a well-known uh, phrase, uh, which really means that uh, the government financing itself with taxes versus borrowing has equivalent effects on the economy. That's what that... Uh, Ricardian equivalence means. So I could never figure out why George Stigler in particular, who was a great historian of economic thought, didn't say during that seminar, well, there's something in Ricardo that relates to this idea, but nobody said that. And it really wasn't until two years later when Jim Buchanan said this was Ricardian equivalence that I heard that uh, idea, and then I went back and I looked what da at what David Ricardo had, and in his main book, it's actually pretty incoherent, but he had a uh, pamphlet called Funding System, which is quite obscure and hard to find, uh, where he does actually lay out something that sounds like Ricardian equivalence. And then I uh, uh, sort of uh, looked at that. Now, there's something called Stigler's Law. Uh, Stigler's Law says that nothing is ever named after the person who invented it. Um, and then the funny part of that is supposed to be that that's also true of Stigler's Law. <laughs> because apparently that came from uh, Robert Merton Sr., who was uh, a scholar in history of science who was at MIT. And then Stephen Stigler, St uh, George Stigler's son, modified Stigler's Law uh, 
to say that uh, famous things are always named after the second person to invent them. So that doesn't seem to work for Ricardian equivalence, which you uh, mentioned. Um, so when I heard that this was supposed to be Ricardian equivalence, I spent a lot of effort looking at things before Ricardo and his major book from in 1810 or 12 or something like that. And I figured it would be easy to find an earlier treatment of something that amounted to Ricardian equivalence. And of course, the first place I looked was at Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Um, but I spent a lot of effort and I couldn't find anything before Ricardo that sounded like Ricardian equivalence. And if you look at Adam Smith on these matters about uh, the government financing itself by taxing versus borrowing, it's actually uh, not very well organized and it doesn't have a coherent argument about what the effects would be. So in the end I accepted the idea that yes, this is Ricardian equivalence and I think that that's a very nice uh, terminology. So anyway, I, of course, greatly benefited by uh, working with Milton and Gary Becker and George Stigler at, uh, uh, at, at Chicago. Uh, looking back on it now, I probably shouldn't have left Chicago in 1975 because uh, uh, even though the place was basically crazy, aside from those three guys, uh, as you say, working with people like that sort of makes it all worth it. So maybe I should have stayed there and Possibly I would still be there uh, if I had stayed there in 1975, but I uh, didn't end up uh, doing that. Um, now, despite what Steve Forbes uh, said last night, uh, Harvard also has a lot of great economists. I think it's a terrific department. And even though Harvard has a reputation of being kind of leftist, uh, which is particularly well-deserved if you look outside of the economics department, um, I found it a very uh, congenial atmosphere for me to operate in. Uh, a lot of people have different views from what I have on macroeconomics and about policy activism and it, what's happened uh, particularly since the financial crisis in 2009. But it's certainly a climate where one can operate with one's views without feeling uh, any kind of hostility or anything like that. So I found Harvard a, a very uh, good place to operate in. Uh, it, it's very different from the Chicago of the 1970s, but I think it's a very positive place. I don't know if that helps you in terms of uh, advice for you personally, but that's my outlook on uh, particularly Chicago and Harvard. We have time for one more question. I don't know if this is the, the great last question or not, but if I was a, if I'm a poor person, and are a bunch of poor people and don't have a, a great uh, deal of talent or hope of really escalating my income, why would I be jumping up and down and, and having the, when the economic gurus say 2% is great inflation, why wouldn't I say 2% deflation? Which would, I, if I was a poor person, would I like 2% inflation or 2% deflation as a policy objective? I think what poor people and everybody else are really interested in is what ha is happening over time to the real command of resources that they have. So you would think about real income, you would think about real consumer expenditure. And in the first instance, whether inflation is plus two or minus two percent, doesn't necessarily matter that much for what's happening in real terms. So if everybody's nominal income is going up at some rate that is compensating for inflation, then that's basically fine, at least on the first order. Now, I also think it's true, since you were talking about poor people, I think poor people have a lot of stake in overall economic growth. And sometimes it's thought that the focus should just be on redistributing income and not what happens to the total pie, which is about overall economic growth. Now, I think the strongest indication of that, about why uh, overall growth is so important, uh, is something in the data that you get since around uh, 1980 from China and India. China and India have been two champions of economic growth. China since the late 1970s, uh, India since the mid-1980s. And because those countries have so many people, the uh, long-term growth that's occurred in those two places has moved millions of people out of poverty. And in particular, if you look at China, 
and hundreds of millions of people now no longer below the poverty line because of the overall economic growth in that country. I don't think there's anything comparable to that in world history in terms of improving welfare. So I think that's what should give everybody, maybe even including Pope Francis, a stake at thinking about overall economic growth and efficient eco economies, and not just think about the rich giving to the poor. Because uh, that example, China and India, over the last 30 years, I think is very compelling, and it suggests that somebody who cares about the, the lot of poor people should be particularly uh, focused on what is it that determines real economic growth, especially over the long term. And that's my main focus in terms of thinking about good macroeconomic policies, whether in the relation to the recent Great Recession or in a broader uh, context. Thank you very much, Dr. Barrow.